So in the book of Mark, the very first message that Jesus comes and preaches to everyone, the very first message that he speaks is this, repent and believe the good news. Repent, repent, repent and believe the good news. And then in the book of Acts, when the church is starting, the very first Christian message, so Jesus has died, he's resurrected back from the dead, he's ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit has been sent, and Peter goes out into Jerusalem to preach this first Christian message to the city. Thousands of people come to Jesus, they, they, they want to believe in Jesus, and they ask Peter, what in the world are we supposed to do next? Now that we believe, what are we supposed to do? And he tells them, repent, repent, repent. Often when we talk about having faith in Jesus, we just talk about this part of belief. And we kind of equate that with, I agree with a certain set of statements, and therefore I have faith. But actually, that's not how Scripture talks about faith. Scripture talks about faith as the process of repent and believe. Repent and believe. But this word repent is not really a popular word today in our world, is it? I think most people, they don't even have the word repent in their vocabulary. And if they do, if they've ever even heard the word repent, they think kind of negative things about it. If their only image of repent is probably something like, um, you know, they were walking down the street one day and they they passed a guy with a big uh, yellow sign with Sharpie written all over it, repent, and he's on a bullhorn yelling at them about certain sins saying repent and talking about hell and stuff, right? Why yellow? Well, it was the paper the guy's mom had in her printer, and he, of course, lives in her basement, right? And it's like, when they think about this word repent, when people think about this word repent, they either don't know what it means, or they have a very negative connotation about the word and misunderstand it. Maybe they have something in their mind, like a scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where the priests are going around and to repent, they're hitting themselves in the head with pieces of wood, or I'm probably the only one who's still, I'm getting old, okay, you know? Only one who probably watches those movies still. But when we think about this word repent, we misunderstand it or we don't know what it means. But the Bible says that we are saved by faith and faith must include, faith has to include repentance. That's Jesus' message. Repent and believe. Repent. Repent and believe. So our understanding of repentance is absolutely key to having faith. So what does repent mean? Well, the beautiful thing is that Jonah chapter 3 is all about repentance. The last verse is going to make it clear that this whole chapter is about repentance. And so by seeing a group of people in this chapter that are going to repent, and by seeing a guy, Jonah, who has been resisting repenting the whole book, we're going to be able to get a picture of exactly what repentance truly means. Well, here's how the book began. Before we get into chapter 3, I actually want to go back to the very beginning of the book. Jonah 1, verses 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to the Tarshish. Then the last couple of weeks, we looked at this story where Jonah's running away from God in this ship, which is funny because he can't get away from God. God tracks him down, brings a storm. The sailors actually come to faith in Yahweh, but they throw him overboard. Jonah hits the water. He gets swallowed by a fish. After three days, he prays to God, and then God has the fish spit him out on the dry land, and Jonah has now made his way to Nineveh. So after resisting God, after not repenting, after going the opposite way, Jonah's finally ready to accomplish this mission that God had wanted to send him on the whole time, to bring this message to the city of Nineveh. So beginning of, verse, or of chapter 3 goes like this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. So you see how similar the beginning of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 3 are? They're near mirror images, but they have a different outcome. Why? Because Jonah has a different response. In chapter 1, it says that Jonah ran away from the Lord, but now in chapter 3, it says Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. So it's the same words from God. It's the same mission that God is giving both times, but it's a different outcome because Jonah has a different response because Jonah headed a different direction. But the beauty here is that God gives us second chances, right? I mean, that's what 
It says in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Because God is always relentlessly pursuing you. Even if you think of yourself as a screw-up, even if you think you've been running the wrong way too long, even if you've messed up over and over again, God is the God of second and third and fourth chances. He's always relentlessly pursuing us with his love. If only we'll turn and listen. And that's the thing. Both Jonah and Nineveh were heading in the wrong direction. They're both heading in the wrong direction away from God. Of course, it's really obvious in the story with Jonah, he literally ran the opposite way that God told him to go down. He's running away from God in the wrong direction. But Nineveh was too. Nineveh is this huge empire, is, is, is part of the Assyrian empire at the time, and it's the most evil empire. I mean, they tortured people, they enslaved people. They were running away from the ways of God. They were going the wrong direction in their empire, the wrong direction in their city. That's what starts the whole book, is that God wants to get a hold of them and get them living in the other direction. Now, we drift in the wrong direction from God, too. Some of us, it's in the ways like Nineveh, where it's those kind of big, obvious sins in our life. We've gone through those seasons of life, right? But then other times we, we head away from him in more subtle ways, like not giving him the attention he deserves, like putting other things in front of God, but saying we still believe in him, right? We too had the wrong direction away from God. Verse three, now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. So skeptics that look at this book will say, ah, it wouldn't have taken three days to walk across Nineveh. The Bible's wrong. The Bible doesn't say, though, that Jonah walked in a straight line across Nineveh. It says he walked through it. So he walks down a straight line. He walks down every street. He's going back and forth in every street saying this message, right? And that would have taken three days. So what message is he proclaiming as he walks down every street in this big city? Verse 4, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So why 40 days? It's kind of curious, right? Well, years before this happened, God actually met with Moses on the top of Mount Sinai after the people had abandoned him to follow the golden calf. Do you remember that scene? And years later, Jesus would spend 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection, which was after they had abandoned him on the cross. So there's something about 40 days where God wants to communicate to us, that he gives us a window. He gives us a chance to turn back to him to admit our wrongs, to seek him, to find him, to repent. In Hebrew, though, Jonah, his message, the message that he preaches, five words in the Hebrew language. Only five words. It's curiously short. And he tells them nothing about God's love. He tells them nothing about God's grace. He tells them nothing about who God is. He tells them nothing about forgiveness. So why is he giving them the absolute bare minimum? Well, if you've been here for the first two weeks in the message series, we said that Jonah is not a hero. He's the anti-hero. An anti-hero in a story is someone who is the main character, but they do nothing good. <laughs> They're the main character, but they don't have any redeeming qualities. They don't have any good qualities about them. And so the reason that he doesn't give them that message of God's love the reason why he gives them just the bare minimum to repent, but says nothing about belief, is because he doesn't want them to believe. He's actually still <laughs> dragging his heels, hoping that these people don't turn to God. That's why he's the antihero. He gives them the base minimum because he hopes that they do not accept the message. So some years ago, I was in uh, Southern California, I was at a church conference, and I decided to skip a class or two. And I wanted to check out Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, you see it in all the movies, right? Terrible mistake. Don't do it. It's way worse in real life. So I drive down to Hollywood Boulevard, and, and, and I'm, I'm there, and I'm, like, walking up and down the streets trying to find the different stars and all that. And there's these guys on the corner, like multiple groups of guys with these huge billboards that they're holding uh, with pictures of fire and hell. And they're screaming on bullhorns at people as they go by. I'm like, what in the world is going on? But you know what I didn't see the whole time? 
Because I had to keep going back and forth. Because, you know, John Stamos's little star is not going to find itself, right? I didn't see one person stop and talk to them. I didn't see one person actually come to faith. And it made me wonder if that was even their goal in the first place. Or if they were like Jonah, that they were so self-righteous that the point of the message wasn't to get people to find God's grace and love. They were presenting only a one-sided version of God. Only God's justice, only God's judgment, only God's wrath. They said nothing of his grace, nothing of his mercy, nothing of his love. It's kind of like Jonah. Jonah's like that guy. He's presenting this one-sided God. Not both sides of God, just one side, just of judgment, just of wrath, just of anger. And it's not particularly compelling. So just like Jonah gave this one-sided message, they were too. But the shocking thing in this story is actually, unlike what you normally see, this message worked on the Ninevites. Verse 5. The Ninevites believed God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. So, despite Jonah's super lame message, these people actually repent. They repent. Now, here's what you're supposed to be noticing in the story if you've been reading it from the beginning. You're supposed to contrast these pagan Ninevites with the prophet Jonah. Remember, the prophet Jonah, he refused to obey God. He refused to repent from running away from God. That's how the whole big fish thing got involved, is that he wouldn't repent and turn the other direction. God had to do it for him. So while he refused to repent, the Ninevites, they, re they repent immediately. The most violent, cruel people on earth at the time, they actually repent, but the prophet himself would not. But before you get too ahead of yourself and think that these Ninevites that they came to this fully-fledged belief and faith in Yahweh that is not where the text leads us. They did not start, you know, believing in Yahweh. They didn't start shopping at Mardell's. They didn't start the Hillsong playlist on their Spotify. They didn't get there, okay? So pay attention to this phrase, believed in God, in verse 5. The word God there in verse 5 is the word Elohim. It's more of a word for any deity. It could be used for any God at that time. It's like a generic God, G-O-O-D, in verse 5. But it was not the word Yahweh. They did not come to faith in the personal God of Israel. That's important because back in Jonah chapter 1, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we saw these sailors, the pagan sailors on the, the boat, Remember, they, they actually did come to faith in Yahweh. And they prayed to Yahweh and they sacrificed to Yahweh. So there's a difference here. These Ninevites repent, but they don't come to this fully-fledged faith in God. So they do repent. They acknowledge their evil ways. They say they'll turn from them, but they do not forsake their idols. They don't sacrifice to Yahweh. We get no language around their faith in Yahweh. So it doesn't appear that they were saved because salvation is about belief. It's not about behavior, right? Salvation's not just about repentance. It takes both repentance and belief, which makes you wonder. In the story as you're reading it, it makes you kind of wonder, go, okay, what would have happened if Jonah would have actually preached the full message? Instead of just five words, this lame message just about God's anger and justice, what if he would have spoken the name of Yahweh? Would they have believed? This is the same question for us. Sometimes we wonder, if we could just speak the name of Jesus to our friends, would they believe? Verse 6. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Now, this is not the story we usually hear about the book of Jonah. Like in kids' books, a lot of times Jonah is placed as the hero. But instead, in this story, Jonah's the one being difficult, and it's the evil king of Nineveh who immediately, when he hears the message, repents and, and puts on sackcloth. He repents immediately. Verse 7. This is the proclamation he, the king, issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Repentance? If you're trying to figure out what repentance means, it requires humility. Repentance requires humility. The people, the king, 
Even the animals are fasting and wearing sackcloth. Why the animals? Because this book is intentionally comedic, okay? We don't quite get its comedy because it's, you know, comedy from like a few thousand years ago. We don't even get comedy from the 1950s anymore. So, but it's supposed to be funny. Now, this says that they put on sackcloth. Sackcloth, sackcloth was this way of showing that you realized that you needed to humbly bring yourself before God. And so Old Testament, what you'll see in the Old Testament is when people recognize that they had messed up and they needed to admit that, they needed to, to, to head the other way, they needed to repent, they would put on sackcloth. So sackcloth was, well, think of a big burlap bag that was meant to carry like grain, right? And you use it a bunch of times, it's worn out, just a bag, that's sackcloth. And have you ever been going to a game, like maybe you went to a Bronco I don't know if anybody goes to Broncos games anymore, but you're going to a different sort of game, right? And it was going to rain. You're like, I don't have a poncho. So you go to your garage, and maybe I'm the only person who's ever done this. You get like a trash bag, and you cut holes for the arms and the head, okay? All right, apparently, I'm the only one that's done this. That's what they would do with the sackcloth. They'd take that big bag that was meant to carry grain or something, and they'd cut holes in it, and they'd take off their fancy clothes, and for days on end, you would wear this sackcloth, this grain bag around everywhere you went. And it was supposed to be this outer representation of the inner condition of humble repentance. Your way of saying, man, I've, I, I have got to humble myself and come before God because I have done wrong. Humble repentance. Because repentance requires humility. It's this, a, a very similar idea with, with fasting. Why, that's why there's this, this talk of not tasting anything, not eating or drinking. Fasting from food gives us time to focus on God, time to contemplate our own condition, time to think about our own repentance. The king of Nineveh goes further. He adds this. He says, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Give up their evil ways. This phrase actually in our translation isn't the best. Uh, it says, give up their evil, uh, get, let them give up their evil ways. It's not quite what it says in the Hebrew. Instead, in the Hebrew, this give up is actually the Hebrew word shub, which means to turn, to turn. And that's going to be important as we, we head through the very end of this, this passage here. So the verse should really read, turn from their evil ways. They turned from their evil ways. This is repentance. They decided we're headed in this direction. We've been do, doing evil, and man, they were good at doing evil, right? And, and we're going to actually turn, and now we're going to go in a different direction away from that evil. They turned. Verse 9, this is still the king of Nineveh speaking. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. So now the king of Nineveh actually uses the same word that was just used in the previous verse. Turn, Hebrew, shub. He's hoping that if the Ninevites turn from their evil ways, God will turn from his proclamation of destruction and wrath and anger against their city. His decision to bring down his justice on them and punish them for all these evil things that they had been doing. Which means the king realizes something that Jonah could not get his mind around. That God is not a God of love or justice, but a God of love and justice. Jonah, Jonah wanted a God of only anger and justice. Well, at least for his enemies, right? But the king of Nineveh recognized God's anger and justice, but also recognized God's love and compassion. We, too, have to be able to recognize both sides, both of these aspects of God. We don't want a one-sided faith. We don't want a one-sided faith. And this is really hard in today's world because it tries to push you into these one of two directions. So today, many people with a one-sided faith, they're kind of like Jonah, right? We've seen these people. We know these people. Maybe at times we've been these people. And it's people who... Man, they hold signs about God's anger. They only talk about the sins of others. They don't share about Jesus' love. And so often, people who are known for preaching God's justice and truth, they're not really known for people who are compassionate on the poor and oppressed, right? 
But at the same time, on the other side, often today, people with a one-sided faith only believe in God's compassion. They never speak the truth, never warn people about God's wrath. They never say that Jesus is the only way to a forever with God. And so people who are known for having that sort of compassion today, they're not known for speaking the truth about God. But we don't want to have to choose just one of these two sides, right? I mean, this is one of the great tensions our church tries to live in. We do not want to be people of a one-sided faith, people who only believe in this one-sided God. We want a God. We want to believe in a God. We want to follow a God. We want to tell others about this true God who is infinitely loving, always wanting to forgive everyone but is also infinitely just. He never allows sin to go unpunished. That's the God that's presented here in this chapter of Jonah. This God who desperately wants to forgive the Ninevites, who who wants to pardon them, who is going to great lengths to bring this prophet to them because he wants to forgive them. And yet, still, he is a God who refuses to allow their evil to go unpunished if it continues. It's not just one side compassion or justice. We don't want a one sided faith. And ultimately, God's love and justice were completed on the cross, where Jesus died to forgive our sins, but also to take on the wrath of God's justice at the same time. Verse 10. When God saw, so this is this is a The last verse in the chapter, it tells us what the whole chapter is about. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Again, we get this Hebrew word shub, to turn. So now we've read this word four different times just in verses 8 through 10. So you can probably figure out what this chapter is all about, right? To turn, to repent. And we have verse 10 here because the author wants to make it crystal clear what he's trying to get at. He doesn't want to leave it. He doesn't want to leave you wondering. This whole chapter is about repentance. And here what we see is that God responds to our repentance. And you ask yourself, okay, God says he relents. He will not bring that destruction on Nineveh like he had declared. Why did he not do that? What led him to relent? Well, the answer is because the people had turned from their evil ways. They had turned. They had repented. And God responds to our repentance. It doesn't matter how far you've walked in the wrong direction from him. It doesn't matter how bad of a past you think you have. It doesn't matter how much of a mess of your life you have made. No, God will respond to your repentance. God will respond if you will turn the other direction. So we don't need to decide. You know, some biblical passages, you get to the end, you're trying to like, oh, what is this about? You don't need to decide. Tips its hand right in the last verse. It's all about repentance. It's all about this Hebrew word shub, which means to turn. But again, it's so easy to have a misunderstanding of repentance. Often we equate repentance, I think, with shame. And so we need to know that repentance is not self-shaming. This kind of comes from a weird historical trend where in the Middle Ages, people began to punish themselves for their sins. Maybe you've seen images from like medieval movies, like a priest whipping themselves, right? This was a form of what they thought repentance was. And then in the Catholic Church, this became something called penance, where you punish yourself with repetitive prayer. And that became like repentance, right? And so today... Following that historical trend, a lot of times when we think about repentance as Christians, it's self-shaming. He even used to work with another pastor who he would call himself uh, uh, pawn scum all the time, right? It's like, that's, that's not what repentance is. It's not that voice. Sometimes we think, you know, that voice in your head that says sometimes, ah, oh, man, you're a screw up. Man, you've messed this up. Man, you're a mess. And we think, oh, that must be repent. That is not repentance. That's not Repentance, that is a dark voice that does not come from God. Repentance is not self-shaming. Instead, biblical repentance is just what we see the Ninevites doing. In the Hebrew, it's this word shub, to turn. In the Greek, in the New Testament, it's the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. 
And so to repent is to change your mind and turn another direction. It has nothing to do with putting yourself down. It has nothing to do with shaming yourself. It's all about turning, changing your mind so you can live in this new direction. It's about heading one way and saying you're going to go the other way. To repent is to change your mind and turn in another direction. Imagine you're a soldier in an army, right? And you're like marching through a field with your whole platoon, Okay, and you're marching in one direction. And then suddenly, I don't want to like, I don't know how to march. I was never in the army. Right? So you're marching through this field, and then your sergeant yells out, Halt! Bout face, turn, forward march. And everybody in the platoon, they stop on a dime, right? And then they turn 180, and then they go back the opposite direction. That is a picture of repentance. That's a picture of repentance. It is the decision to change your mind on the direction you were going and then turn, decide to turn and head back the other direction. The ancient rabbis, how they would describe repentance, it was like there was a home and you walked in the home through one door and then you made up your mind to change when you were in the home and then you walked back out the house through another door in a new direction. To repent is to change your mind and turn another direction. And that's, that's a really different definition than we often have in our mind. One of punishing yourself or putting yourself down or shaming yourself is totally different. Now the question then is that that's the definition of repentance. If it's to turn and change your mind, if it's to turn in this new direction, why couldn't Jonah get there? Why was it so hard, in like particularly chapter 1, for Jonah to stop running away from God and turn back to God, turn in this new direction, repent? Why is he going to even keep not getting it in the next chapter? Here's why. Jonah already decided on his own direction in life. You see, actually, the book of Jonah is not the very first time that we meet Jonah in Scripture. There's this super brief mention of Jonah as the prophet of Israel in 2 Kings 14. And there in that chapter, I know it's everyone's favorite chapter, so I probably don't have to say anything about it. So there in 2 Kings 14, we meet this evil king, Jeroboam. That's why no one names their kids Jeroboam, right? Dude was evil. Okay? And what he was, so he was using violence and killing people to gain personal power. Dude was messed up. Now, usually in the Old Testament, what you'll find is there'll be this evil king, and then God will have the prophet of Israel go to that evil king and be like, dude, you got, what are you doing, right? That's not exactly what he said, but he would try to get the king to repent. He would try to get the king to change, and the King would be like, no, I'm too evil. And they wouldn't do it, right? But it was the prophet's role to go call that evil king to change. But instead, in 2 Kings 14, what we find is Jonah actually puts his stamp of approval on Jeroboam. It's kind of an odd thing. He doesn't call him out, which makes me suspect that Jonah, he already had a direction he wanted to go in his life, and nothing was quite going to get in the way. Like the good life that he wanted was, oh man, he wanted to be chilling in Israel's royal court. He wanted to be living off the riches of this king that he had stamped with his approval. He wanted to keep rubbing elbows with all the most powerful people in his nation. He had already decided his direction. He's like, that's my life, right? Now we do this too, right? We kind of decide on a, a direction for our, our, our life. We decide this is, this is the way I am heading. Jonah had already decided on his own direction in life. So Jonah had devised a way then to keep believing in God, but keep determining his own direction. And that's where he got in trouble. Because now in the book of Jonah, we find that God wants to break into Jonah's life and, and, and change his direction. I mean, God, this, this whole book is about God trying to get Jonah to head to the city of Nineveh and call them to repent. And so what God is asking Jonah to do is to give up on his own direction for his life. He's like, you know that royal court you love so much? I want you to leave it. You know those people you hate? I want you to go help them. I want you to bless your enemy. You know that this whole political system that you've given your, your, your life for and your stamp of approval for? It's not going to be number one in your life anymore. So Jonah, he couldn't do that. 
Couldn't bring himself to do it. He had already determined what direction he wanted to head, and he then even devised a way to keep on believing in God while determining his own direction. Even when God came to him and said, you're doing it wrong, you gotta go help your enemy. And I think often we're in the same boat. The reason we can't bring ourselves is to repent, to repent, is that we've already decided our, our version of the good life. Like we've already decided what we think the direction for our life is. We have that in mind. And so then as God calls us into other things, as God calls us to turn, as God calls us to head a different direction, we're like, no, no, <laughs> no, God, I'm already going this direction. I already know which way I'm heading. I already know what I want out of life. I just want to add you onto this thing. Why can't you get behind my direction? And so then we just start to devise a way that we can believe in God and determine our own direction. A God who just stamps our direction with his stamp of approval. Who isn't gonna come call us to do crazy things like go to Nineveh or our enemy and call them to believe? No, a God that just keeps stamping with his rubber stamp of approval the direction that we wanna head because we've already decided on it. The reason we can't turn is we're already so committed to the direction we're heading down. We've already decided our direction. It's kind of like, have you, maybe you go on a road trip, right? This happened to me years ago. I was uh, somewhere in the, the Midwest. I think we were on the border of like uh, Missouri and, and Arkansas. And you've been driving for a while and, and this was before Google Maps, so you couldn't put it in there, right? And uh, so, so, so we've been driving for like three, four hours and we get out of the car to get gas. And we go in the, the gas station. We're not quite sure where we are. We were in, in college, so we never knew where we were. And we're like, oh, how do we get, you know, back to Kansas City? Where we were from? She's like, what are you talking about? We were in Arkansas. We had gone the wrong direction. We weren't even in the right state, right? And so what, what do you do at that point? Well, there's two decisions. You can either get back in your car and be like, I was wrong. I went the wrong way. And now I need to turn around and I need to head the other direction. Or the other decision is you get back in your car and you're like, ooh, I have invested way too much in this direction. I guess we're gonna find an apartment in Arkansas and live here, right? But that's what a lot of us do. We're so invested in our direction. We're so invested in our way, the, the way we've determined that the good life for us is gonna look like. That when God calls us to repent, when he starts pointing out things that, oh man, You've gotten this wrong. You've gone to, with culture on that. You've compromised on that. I've called you years ago to sacrifice in this way and you never got around to it. I've called you to commit in these ways and you've never done it. And we just keep going in this direction. We've, got, we've been like, God, I'm not gonna, I've got too much invested in this direction. I can't turn around. I can't turn. So the reason that we don't repent is, man, we've already decided on our own direction. We've already decided and it's costly to repent. It's costly to reshape your life, isn't it? You have to admit you're wrong. Some of us, sorry is not even in our vocabulary. It's so hard to admit we were wrong. And we can't turn, we can't repent because we've already decided this is how I'm heading. And I'm just gonna have to add some pretend idea of God. I'm gonna have to devise a way to add him as I go along. So if you're not sure about Jesus, here's my hope. It's that same hope that Jesus spoke in his first message in the book of Mark. Repent and believe. It's the same hope that Peter spoke in that first message in Acts. Repent and believe. My prayer for you is that you would come to a place where you can repent. Say, man, I've been heading the wrong direction in life, and now I'm going to turn towards Jesus. I had a new direction. That you repent and believe, and you realize that only Jesus makes that possible only Christ. But for those of us who were followers of Jesus, here's my hope, is that we can have a lifestyle of repentance. We can have a lifestyle that's like, just continuously ask God, where am I going wrong? Like, what's wrong about my direction right now, and how can I correct it? That we live a lifestyle where we're in Scripture every day, saying, God, how am I thinking wrong about things in life? Not trying to prove ourselves right when we go to school. No, but asking, how am I wrong? What do I need to repent from? A heart that is that humble, that it continuously asks God, correct me, change me, help me turn every day 
to you in this new direction, that he would give us a heart of repentance.